Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, you know that when I come up here, one of the first things I'll do, I'll ask that we begin to thank God. You can't thank God enough because God is a good God. He's a gracious God. He's a faithful God. His mercy is new every morning. His loving kindness is new every morning. And so this evening, Lord, we thank you because we declare that you are a good God. We thank you because we know you are our Alpha, you are Omega, the beginning and the end. You are the author, you are the finisher of our faith. Father, we thank you because all things consist in you. Father, Lord, we bless your holy name because our lives are in your hands. Father, Lord, we thank you because you have planned, you have destined predestined our lives. You have established everything that concerns our lives even before we are born. Father, we thank you this evening because, Lord, you love us with an everlasting love. Father, Lord, I thank you for every single person here and every family represented here. Father, Lord, I thank you because I know they are not here by accident. Father, Lord, I thank you because you brought them here this evening. And Father, Lord, purpose why you brought them here, you didn't bring them here to waste their time. Oh God, but you brought them here to be able to establish certain things in their lives. And oh God, this evening I pray that that which you have proposed, that which you have determined even before the foundation of the world consigning their lives, Father, Lord, will be established in Jesus' name. Father, we take authority over this atmosphere. We ask that your spirit, Lord, will flow freely in our midst today in the mighty name of Jesus. And oh Lord, I ask that you make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. Father, Lord, I pray, oh God, that my mouth will speak wisdom and my heart will give understanding in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord, I give you all the praise this evening. Lord, I give you all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You may have your seat. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I hope you are not feeling too cold. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I believe that you came here because it was a decision and a choice that you made to come for redemption service this evening. And I believe that, that your choice and that your decision indeed will be fruitful in Jesus' name. You know, like Pastor began to say in the last, um, I think, four Wednesdays now, he's been doing a series, Problems and Promises. Hallelujah. And so last week he asked, actually he wanted me to come here last week, you know, but because I was preparing for an exam, I told him after, you know, he wanted me to come and talk about um, the scripture, Romans chapter 4, verse 17. He wanted me to come and talk to you about it because that's actually one of my favorite scriptures. Hallelujah. And, Lo and Pastor began to talk about it last Wednesday. When he began to talk about promises, you know, that was where he stopped last Wednesday. You know, um, normally, I would always say that um, um, Prov um, Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 23 or 25 is a scripture that I used to learn the principles of faith. Hallelujah. That was the scripture that I used to cut my first experience in the work of faith. Hallelujah. And there's a term in um, project management, is a term, a term, it's called um, organizational process assets. And I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about project management this evening. Hallelujah. 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 I'll press you a little bit with the new things I've learned. Hallelujah. You know, so there's a term in project management called organizational process assets. Organi organi organizational process assets is the principles, policies, procedures, practices, templates, guidelines, knowledge base, historical information that an organization acquires. It becomes the asset of that organization. And anytime they, you know, they, they finish a project, or anytime they undertake a project, there are lessons and things they learn, templates they develop things. And so they keep acquiring these knowledge, these practices, these templates, these um, guidelines, these practices, these procedures, these policies. And they become an asset of the organization. And they use that asset, you know, to apply, you know, to, to other projects they'll be doing. Praise the Lord. And so in the work of faith, and I'm going to say something to you, and I, I, I ran into a friend yesterday, and she said exactly the same thing to me. In the work of faith, there's always like a defining point when you learn the principles of faith, when God takes you through certain things. And after you learn the principles of faith, it becomes your assets. It becomes your guidelines, it becomes your policies, it becomes your principles, it becomes your template, you know, that you can always use when you are confronted with another problem in your life. And you know, I will normally say to people, I say there is nothing and I, I mean it, that if I want today, I will not be able to get the only reason why I'll not get it is because I refuse to pay the price. Because I refuse to apply the principles of faith I know. Hallelujah. The principles of faith are timeless. The principles of faith are the same in the Bible. And I'll be sharing some of them with you today from Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Yesterday, Pastor and I went somewhere. It was um, somebody's 60th birthday. 
And went there and I ran into a friend I've not seen for the last five years. The last time I saw her was like five years ago. But three years ago, I heard she was diagnosed with cancer of the lungs. And when we got that information, we felt really, really bad about it, you know. I didn't go to visit her. We're not that close, but of course, when we run into, into each other, we, we, you know, we're like friends. And I think there was a time I was actually mentoring her because she said something to me yesterday that I didn't even remember. You know, and she was diagnosed with cancer of um, the lungs, you know, but in my house and every time I was praying for her. And I was praying, you know, for God because I, I know her husband and her, her very well. They are faith people and I knew that if they would apply themselves to the principles of faith, you know, I know she would overcome that affliction. And of course, he went to um, Germany, they went for treatment up and down. But by last year, she went back to Germany and she was declared cancer free. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So when I ran into her yesterday, I was just like appreciating her and I was just telling her, thank you for your work of faith, how you stood, you know, on the word of God to be able to conquer cancer. And she said to me, she said, you know, when she was told that she had cancer of the lungs, she said to the devil, is that all? He said, is that all? Is that all? You can track me, is that all? And she said, God said something to her. Because when she got married, you know, she had a daughter's report that her womb was... Um, I think introverted or something like that. I'm not sure what the term is now, you know. But of course, they told her she couldn't have children because of the shape of her womb. It was not a normal womb. And she stood on the word of God. And she, today she has three kids. And so she said, God said to her when she was diagnosed with cancer, that haven't you overcome before? If you have overcome before, you can still overcome. And that's why I started with organizational process assets. The guidelines, the templates, the knowledge, the practices, the procedures, companies, organizations always keep them as their assets because they will use them again. And she said, God said to her, and then she said to me, she said, um, Pastor Nima, remember, you know, when I was trusting God for children, there was this little notebook you gave me with confessions, your confessions in that notebook, and you gave that notebook to me, and you gave it to me for three months. And you said, I should take that notebook and develop my own confession book. And that was what I used to develop. And she was asking me, can't you remember? I said, I can't remember. She said, you gave me, can't you remember that small? I was trying to remember, the honest truth, I can't remember. But she said, you really helped me because you gave me that small notebook. And you told me, you said, um, you know, that I should go and um, um, compile my own confessions that I would use to trust God for children. And I took that notebook out. It was with me for three months before I returned it to you. And I used some of the scriptures and your confessions in that book to be able to form my own confession. Praise the Lord. Pastor began to talk about the series, the series, Problems and Promises. And I'm going to start, just listen to me carefully, you will understand. But I want to start with certain things I learned during my project management training. We learned the difference between operation and projects. And I'm going to divide the work of faith into those two areas. That the work of faith, number one, is operational. And then the second work of faith should be projectized, praise the Lord. And when I mean operational, there's a work of faith. We work daily as Christians. The word of God says the just must live by faith. As a child of God, as a Christian, every day of your life is a work of faith. When you wake up in the morning, you pray to God, you believe. When you are going out, you believe that God will um, protect you, God will preserve you, God will deliver you. That is a work of faith. Because you pray and you believe. You, have, you work in a certain level of faith that is continuous, is sustained, it's a daily thing, it's a moment thing, it's every day, it's supposed to be operational in your life, something you are using every day and every moment, it's not supposed to come to an end. As a Christian, all the days of your life, from the beginning until you die, you have to work the work of faith. And so you work this operational system or method of faith, where you use faith daily, even unconsciously, you are working by faith, hallelujah. But now, I guess where most Christians have problems, um, the, the problem not being able to because the honest truth you see a lot of people with um, with um, issues and the issues keep prolonging year after year year after year and all they do they are waiting for God for a miracle but God is actually waiting on them because they have not learned to um, apply or appropriate the principle of faith and so now I'm talking about problems problems are unique issues of life Problems are not the daily issues, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about certain 
degree and level of problems where it's not just daily, but something that is really very, very serious. For instance, poverty is a problem. Sickness is a problem. When you walk, believe in God, and every day of your life, like, walk in divine health, you know, that's like a walk of faith because that's God's provision for you. So every day, you are trusting, you know, that um, it's divine health. But when you are afflicted with a major affliction, it's no longer, it's not supposed to be the same ordinary faith and casual faith and normal faith that you apply every day, even unconsciously to your problems. You now have to become a concentrated, diligent work of faith. Praise the Lord. And so that's why I'm saying projectize. Okay, operations, like you so said, let's just say the difference between operations. I'm using my project management, you know, um, um, knowledge. You know, um, project. Well, a layman's definition of project is simply like a plan for something, a design, an undertaking, something that you, you, you do, that you plan. It's not casual. A project is never casual. It's something that you plan for, you design, you undertake to do. That's a layman. I saw that definition in the dictionary. But in project management, the definition of project management is a temporary endeavor undertaking to produce a product, a service, or a result. A temporary undertaking, you know, that a temporary endeavor undertaking to pro produce a unique product, service, or result. And so I'm going to look at problems, number one. One of the characteristics, you know, of a project is that it must have a beginning and it must have an end. And so when you talk about problems, it must have a beginning and it must have an end. What I'm trying to get you to understand it, and if you can get the principles of what I'm teaching you this evening, you know your life will change forever. I want you to begin to look at certain issues in your life as a project. Because when you look at certain issues in your life as a project, you will apply concentrated, diligent effort, you know, to overcome that problem. But a lot of us have issues in our lives, and we, we, they, they, there are no procedures, there are no principles. We, we just, and, and we always say in this church, there's a difference between just belief and faith. You know, and so we'll learn some of those things this evening. And so a project is, you know, the difference between a project and a, an operation. A project is temporary. It must have a beginning and it must have an end. That is one most important characteristic of a project. It's not ongoing. And so your problem is not supposed to be ongoing. And so when you confront an issue in your life, you must begin to tackle it as a project. An operation is a sustained thing, something that is sustained and goes. A project, like I already said, is temporary, but if an operation like the everyday kind of faith is ongoing, is continuous. A project is a catalyst for change. If you want change in any, and that's how big organizations, corporations, if they want change in a certain area, they come up with a project. You know, that's why, like they'll say, Forbes magazine says, project management is the number one career in the world. And I encourage as many of you, because even after stay attending, you know, I just said, God just knew what he was doing. Because when I talk about being very intentional, when I talk about being very diligent, de diligent and strategic, God knew I had to go and learn project management. And I think everybody should learn, because your, 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 your mentality and everything about life will change as you begin to see life in different ways and how you, you can tackle the issues of life. You know, and of course, of course, it gives you limitless limitless possibility in the area of career and other things you want to do. And, you know, and so a, a project is a catalyst for change. And when you talk about a, what is a catalyst, something that provokes change. Something that provokes change. Why, of course, in operations, it just maintains the status quo. You know, just like that. You know, so I want you to understand, I'm just trying, as I'm trying to say that, just begin to, I want you to under, begin to think of the issues in your life as I talk and begin to compartmentalize them right now as a project. A project that you are going to work on. A project that you will initiate and you will conclude and finalize. Praise the Lord. You know, so, um, um, so, and, and if you are going to say, let me, I said, I came up with a, de a definition that when you are going to projectize, you know, um, a, 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 a problem, okay, I've already talked about the meaning of, um, the definition of project, but project mani management, you know, is the application, the appropriation, the integration of processes, there are 49 processes, to 10 knowledge areas 
in order to produce or achieve objectives or the requirements of that project. And so when we are talking about projectizing your problem and using faith, it's the application of the principles of faith and the promises of God in order to achieve your desired desire, your desired result or objectives or aim or something. So it has to be also systematic, praise the Lord. And so I'll begin to talk using, okay, first let me go, let me talk about the life cycle because I'm trying to tell you how to projectize your problem. Every project has a life cycle. It has five life cycles. It has initiation, it has planning, it has execution, it has uh, monitoring and control, and then it has closure or closing. And so if you are going to, and I'm, 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 I'm teaching you now how you can projectize your problems, you know, every problem, and I did that when I was trusting God for children, but of course I did not, it's now that I'm beginning to understand that the principles and the methods I followed were actually the principles of project. Number one, if you have an issue, if you have a problem, you know the series we are doing is problems and promises. How are you going to apply the, prince, the promises of God, which is actually the work of faith, to your problems to get results? The first thing you need to do when you have a problem, for instance, you are trusting God for children, you apply the five phases of a project to that problem. Number one, you initiate the project. So the first thing you do is to determine and make a decision that this issue in your life has become a project. Your singlehood, if you are, uh, you are supposed to be married and you're not married now, has become a project in your life. The fact that you don't have a children, you, do, you, you don't have children, has become a project in your life. Poverty has become a project in your life. Affliction, sickness has become a project in your life. So number one, the first thing you do, you initiate it. And what does it mean to initiate? That's what I just said to you. You now desire to take this issue as a project. You desire to take this issue as a project, you now define, you know, what that project is all about. You now, for instance, when I was trusting God for children, you know, there was a day, a day came when I had to initiate that whole um, process as a project. It started with when I was, uh, then we were attending Living Faith. And then I went to church one day, and the pastor then that was preaching said something. If you, you know, then I had a youth ministry. You know, he said, if you claim that you know something, and you don't have results to show. Tell yourself the truth you do not know. And I left church that day very angry with myself. And I said, what am I even doing? Running a youth ministry? What do I know? What do I know? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm barren. I don't have children. So what do I know? So I was very, very angry with myself. I was not angry with the man of God. I was angry with myself. And that day, I made a decision. That is initiation that I was going to start an adventure with God. I was going to take the Bible, read from the beginning Genesis to the end, get all the scriptures on fruitfulness, work it out in my life. And I said to myself, by the time I get to the end of the Bible revelation, I believe I'll have children. And that is what initiation is. You need to be able to define what problem you are in right now and term it as a project, initiate it as a project. The next phase of a project is planning. And so the second thing you did, which I did even then, was to begin to gather the scriptures, you know, and the promises of God that I was going to stand upon, I was going to work out, you know, to see results in that area. And so what you do is you begin to define the different things you need. You begin to, um, is, you, you develop a plan consigning because it has to be and that's what i'm trying to say the work the, the work of faith is not just casual you do this today you know you jump here today hop how do they say it you know that kind of thing it's um deliberate strategic principles procedures the work of faith that's how i applied faith in my life and i saw it produced for me you know uh, pastor has shared so many times when the doctor said we couldn't have children and just standing on the word of god i was able to get pregnant seven four times Praise the Lord, hallelujah, without a doctor's help and everything. So I know the word works, but this was what I did. And so you gather all the, in your planning, you gather all the scriptures and everything that you need to help you achieve this project. Part of what you do in your planning stage is to be able to define and determine the activities and the things that you need to do you know, to make sure these scriptures um, and the promises of God and get results in this area. And so part of what you do is you 
get the scriptures. For instance, part of what I, I, I learned to do was not only the one area that you need to determine is meditation. You need to learn how to take the promise of God. So you begin to write down, you know, I need to gather all my um, 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 promises in the Bible concerning this issue. What am I going to do to see this word of God come to an end, come to manifestation, give me results? I need meditation. You need, I need prayers. I need, you need to determine, I need to serve God diligently. You know, for instance, you know, um, in Proverbs, in Exodus, the word of God says, um, um, if you serve the Lord your God, you bless. So you get those kind of things and determine the things you do. I need to sow certain seeds, you know, so you define, you put them down and everything, what you need to do that you know if you do these things, results will follow. So you plan. And then after planning, you begin to execute. You begin to implement the things you have planned and you have defined in your planning stage. And personally for me, I took, there was this particular strict scripture I was standing upon. You know, it says, um, he makes, the Lord makes the barren woman to keep house and be a joyful mother of children. And so when it came to execution plan, I knew I, was, I had to meditate. I broke down, I took the dictionary. First in my planning stage, looked what it means, the meaning of barrenness. What, especially the word, and, and I'm going to talk about it later, joyful, joyful. What does it mean to be a joyful? I studied women who had children. I studied how I observed the way they behaved. I observed that the fact that they, their children were real, there was no anxiety, there was nothing, they were happy. I watched, I studied everything. And then in my time of execution, I began to implement those things in my life. I began to work and try to develop, you know, um, a level of um, 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 assurance and faith and joy that I truly believe that I had children. I, I, part of in your planning, part of what you need to write down, confession of the word of God, declarations of the word of God, I began to declare certain things. I began to think in a particular manner in my execution stage. And then in monitoring and control, you begin to track, and I believe that's where a lot of people miss it, because that's actually very important. You begin to track and review, you know, the things you are doing, your progress. And for me, you know, one of my, my mantra in life is that I do not believe in self-deception. I tell myself the truth. If I'm not there yet, I tell myself I'm not there. And so I work harder. And so at every stage, every stage, I'll tell if I, if, if I, 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 I had doubts in my, in my heart, if I had fears in my, in my heart, I'll tell myself, I said, oh, you're not there yet. And I kept working on myself. That's reviewing, tracking your progress. And when I got to a point when there was no slight doubt about what I was trusting God for, I knew I had arrived. And at that point, that was when my final, my closing, that was when I was beginning to challenge God and I say, you can't make me a case study. Because in the area of faith, I know I have absolute faith in this area. And I'm not just talking and, and, and as we look at the scriptures, there's what is called weak faith, there's what is called small faith, and there's what is called great faith. And if you want great results in your life, you need to work at the level of great faith. And so when I got to a certain point in my life that I could really say I had great faith, you know, it didn't take up to two months and I got pregnant. Praise the Lord. So we are going to look at Romans chapter 4 verse 17 and I'm going to lay out certain principles. Media, let's go first with, I would look at three different translations. Then I'll take at least four principles from Romans 4 17, you know, to be able to you know, talk to you this evening quickly. As it is written, I have made you, okay, let's start from verse 16. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, verse 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. 18. Who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. 20. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform, 22. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness, 23. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, 
that it was imputed to him. Let's go to New Living Translation. The same scripture from verse 16. New Living Translation. I just want to read the different translations. Those ones will be easier for you to understand. New Living Translation, not NIV. NLV. Oak NLT. New Living Translation. Okay. So the promise is received by faith. It is given. And the first thing I want you to understand, the principle that I look at, is that Abraham received the promise and he received it by faith. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe, verse 17. We are going to verse 23. That is what the scriptures mean. When God told him, I have made you the father of many nations, of many nations, this happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. 18. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that is how many descendants he will have. Verse 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. 20. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Verse 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. 22. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. Okay, let's go to Message Bible. Message Bible from verse 16. 416. Romans 416. Message MSG. Okay. This is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely. And I want you to look at some of the words. Entirely. Entirely. Entirely on trusting God and his ways. This is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely on trusting God, his ways, his principles, his procedures, and then simply embracing him and what he does. God's promise arrives as a pure gift. That's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep the religious traditions and those who have never heard of them. For Abraham is father of us all. He is not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. He is our faith father. The 17th. We call Abraham father. Not because he got God's attention by living like a saint. But because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as a father. That's the promise now. Of many people, Abraham was first named father and then became a father. Because he dared to trust God. To do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life. With a word, make not something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Deciding not to live on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made father of a multitude of peoples. God himself said to him, you are going to have a big family, Abraham. 19. Abraham didn't focus on his own impotence and say it is hopeless. This hundred year old body could never father a, fa a child. Nor did he survey, survey him. You know, a lot of us, we survey our problems. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking courteously, skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God. Verse 21. Sure that God will make good on what he had said. Verse 22. That's why it is said, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. I read these three scriptures so that you have an understanding. For me personally, it was Romans chapter 4 verse 17 to 23 that I learned the principles of faith. The first thing I learned in that scripture 19 years ago was that God gave Abraham a promise. And pastor began to say to you, some of us, and you, sometimes you don't really even have to get, it's good, it's better if you get a rema word and a promise from God. But the Bible is full of promises. The word I stood on 
to get children. God did not give it to me. I picked it from the Bible. I think it's um, Psalm 138 or something that says he makes the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. It was not a Rema word. It was a promise in the word of God. And I took that promise because that's the word of God. And I stood upon it. And I walked it out in my life. And it produced for me. And so the first thing to I do is either get a promise from God directly. He speaks to you a Rema word that God gives to you. Or to look for, and that's the, the initiation stage or the planning stage, to look for promises in the Bible that have to do with your problem. And then the second most important thing for me, that is the basis of faith. And the scripture in, in Romans 4, um, 17 and 18 rightly says it. Abraham believed in a God who raises the dead and calls those things that be not as though they are. And that is where you need to get it right. Because if you get it right at this point, that it's all about God, not even about the promise of the word. It is all about the ability, the character, the integrity, the God that with God, nothing is impossible. Uh, uh, media, give me Romans um, 3 verse 3. We'll go there. Just give it to me. You know, you must believe, and in doing this thing, like I said, the work of faith, you know, a lot of us think we believe God. When we pray, we have more faith or trust in more our words, our choice of words, our prayers than the God. You must. It's the God that you should trust in. It is not about the prayers. It is not about the problem. It is God. What can God do? What do you believe that God is able to do? Do you believe that God is able to do it? And until you know that God is more than able to do it, then you have not arrived, you can never walk a walk of faith. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did, some did not believe? Will their own belief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Continue verse 4. Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true. But every man a liar. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. And so this work of faith is not casual. You know, it is not casual. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 says, there yet remains a rest for the people of God to enter into. In that area where you have that issue, there yet remains a rest. There yet, that's what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 says, and verse 11 says, let, let us therefore labor, let us diligently, the word diligently was used, labor to enter into that rest. And so in issues of problems, not the operations of faith of normal day to day, but when you truly have an issue, you must diligently work the work of faith. And part of working that work of faith is, first of all, begin to get a revelational knowledge of who God is. Because once you get a revelational knowledge of who God is, nothing, absolutely nothing can intimidate you. Because you know you have the God who is able. Hallelujah. The word of God says in Daniel chapter 11, because for, to you, that is not the issue. The issue is that whether we did or not, God has given you your children. And so that was what we determined, I remember. And I keep saying to people, my dad is a medical doctor. You know, I've grown up all my life knowing him before I was born. He had already qualified as a medical doctor. He's been into medical practice in the, for the last 50 something years. He's going to be 80 years this year. He's still practicing medicine. And so normally, when we began to confront the issue of barrenness, not having children, my first result should have been to run to my father. But I will be very sincere and honest with you. Pastor and I, it never crossed our mind. And I'm being very sincere. It did not cross our mind to go to my dad. And it's not as if I don't have a close relationship. Pastor knows. We are very close meted in my family. He knows. Us and our dad lost our mom some few years ago, but we are very, very close meted. All of us, my father and the seven of us, we are very close meted. So it's not the issue I couldn't talk to him about it. But my focus was on God. Our focus was on God. It never crossed my mind. And so when the first year, the first year passed, the second year, it was, and I'm telling you, it was when I decided to initiate this issue as a project. Even then, I didn't know it was a project by the third year that I got my breakthrough. Before then, we were trusting God, we were praying. We were standing on God's promises and everything. But we were not applying calculated, intentional, consistent, Focus principles and procedures, but once we began to do that, I got my breakthrough. 
And so by the second year, going to the third year, one day my mom called me and said, ah, Onyema, what kind of child are you? We've just been watching both of you. We've been waiting you to come and talk to us. You've not come to say anything. What's going on? And I just laughed. I didn't know what to say. Okay, 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 okay. You know, your dad is not a gynecologist. He's a pediatrician, but he has a very, one of the, at that point, one of the best, maybe even like the number one or number two gynecologist in this city of Abuja was his friend. He said your dad saw him somewhere last week and has spoken with him. He's waiting for you. This is his number. Call me. And go and see him. I kept, I kept refusing to go because the honest truth, I've made up my mind that I wanted to just stand on the word of God. But every time she would call me and I was lying to me. When she called, have you gone to see Dr. Acheman? I'll say, oh, I called him. He said he's not in town, but I didn't call him. I was lying. And at one point, I felt that as a Christian, I shouldn't be lying. Okay, let me just go and see him. And then I'll tell her whatever he says. So I now decided I went to go and see him. And truly, I remember, of course, before then, go through some procedures and everything. And the report that came out was my fallopian tubes were blocked. Of course, Pastor had also talked about his own medical, you know. So he said, okay, let him do this other procedure your laparoscopy that will give you know um, an accurate result and he did it and when I remember the day he asked me to come for the result when I sat before him in the office and truly I did it to fulfill all righteousness not because that was where my faith was and I did it once and so when he came he looked at me and he smiled he said I'm not afraid of the result and I looked at him and I laughed I said I'm indifferent and that was the truth I told him I'm indifferent it doesn't matter what the result is because I was not I, I did it to fulfill all righteousness. That was not where my faith and my hope was. So he looked at me and said, um, <laughs> are, you, are you unsure that you're afraid about the result? He had the paper, my file in front of him. I looked at him and I smiled. I said, I'm indifferent. It does not matter what the result is. And then he now laughed and opened his file. And he now said, and that was when my miracle started. But because truly, after that procedure, even though he said one or two things, you know, that kind of thing, but I think like three months later, I knew, but that was not why, but I think God honored my faith. He said to me, said something to me, that I knew that a creative miracle had taken place inside of me. He said that your fallopian tubes are as perfect as a newborn baby, that nothing has ever tampered with pure, clean, perfect. And that was the result he gave me, because I was willing, because there was a first result that was very bad, but by the time I did this one, it had been changed because I trusted in a God who is able to raise the dead and cause those things that be not. So you must determine where your focus is, who you are trusting. The, your solutions, what are you looking at? If you have options, you are truly not trusting God. It is good to work on something, but if the, 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 your confidence is, is it in what you are doing or the God who gives children. So part of Abraham, the only reason why Abraham could walk by faith was that he trusted in a God, he believed in a God who calls those things that be not as though they are, praise the Lord. Secondly, we saw in that particular scripture that we read, that text, you know, that Abraham, you know, believed against hope. There was nothing in the physical to make him hopeful. There was nothing to give him hope. Some of us, in certain situations, we may have hope. For instance, if you are, if you are like, um, if you are, if you are, Trusting God for children, you may have hope. Okay, maybe I'll go and do IVF. You know, but in those days, there were no IVF. There was no solution to barrenness. At that time, Abraham lived. And so Abraham was hoping against hope. The reality of his situation was so bad, 100 years old. And the word of God says he did not consider the deadness of his own body. Neither did he consider that the womb of Sarah was dead. But he believed in a God who raises the dead and cause those things that be not as do they are. You know, hope, hoping, and that's, um, media give us First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. You know, that was also, I have a lot of favorite scriptures. But that also used to be my favorite scripture about certain issues that I knew about in my life. Um, okay. I'm going to read it, then I'll say what I want to say. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let's look at the, the good news translation of it. And then we'll go to the message. I just want you to just be different. I like to do different translations. Good news translation or NI, uh, NLT, anyone. You know, I just want a different translation of the same scripture. Hmm? You don't have it. 
Okay, good news translation or NLT or message Bible, just another tran. Okay. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they'll be ashamed when they see what is. Now, verse 15. 3, 15. 15, verse 15. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Let's look at the Message Bible translation. Message Bible translation. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ, your master. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks you why you are living the way you are. And always with the utmost trust. That used to be one of my favorite scriptures, consigning anything I'm doing, consigning anything I'm believing. I believe that whatever you truly believe in and have faith in and truly, truly believe in, it must become part of your essence. It must flow out of you. And I used to say to myself, the greatest test is when I'm sleeping in deep sleep. And somebody taps me and asks me a question. Why do you think God will give you children? I will not think about it. It will roll out. It will reel out from my mouth because it has already become my essence. And so when you walk yourself, you know, to a point where that belief, that conviction, that understanding become your essence, you don't need always be prepared to give a defense for what you think you are hoping for. If you are not ready in and out of season, if you don't have that thing flowing and oozing out of you, if you are not in, at a point in your life where you don't even have to think about it because it has become part of your reality, then you have not arrived. Praise the Lord. And so, Abraham, and, and so when you get to that point, oh, Abraham was at that point where he hoped against hope. And then the next principle in, the, in that same scripture was that Abraham did not waver at the promise of God. Abraham did not waver. Some translation says Abraham did not stagger at the promises of God. Abraham was not weak in faith. But Abraham was fully persuaded, fully convinced, some translations will say, and fully assured that God who promised is able to do it. Personally, what I did, I went to the dictionary. I got the meaning of what persuasion, being fully persuaded means, what being fully assured means, what being fully confident means. And I began to, you know, monitor and control it that's at that stage now. We begin to review it and track it against what I was thinking. Was I at a state of full persuasion that God had given me children? Was I fully convinced and when I said to myself, no, you have not arrived, I kept working on my belief. I kept meditating. I kept thinking. When I got to that point, I knew I'd arrived. And I'm being very sincere. When you get there, nobody needs to tell you. When your faith is great. You know, but I want to quickly say as a, a roundup, you know, the word of God says every one of us has a measure of faith. Romans chapter 3, I think, um, 12 verse 3, he says every man has been given the measure of faith. Everybody has the measure of faith. And most of the people, that's what you use as your operational faith to your day-to-day. -day. But if you do not develop your faith, it will remain stunted. And the level of results you will get in your life will not be great results. And so you have the responsibility, you know, to develop and work your faith. To a point where your faith can truly be described as great faith. I want us to quickly run through some scriptures, you know. It will give us an understanding. I don't have to talk much. I just want us to read through those scriptures. Okay, um, media, we're going to go to the, um, the book of Matthew. Cha start first with Matthew chapter 6, verse 30. There's what is called weak faith. And you understand what produces weak faith. Okay, you know this very well, so I'm not going to start from the beginning. Now, if God, who closed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will you not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? When you are anxious about anything, concerning that issue you are dealing with, concerning that problem, if you express anxiety, if you are anxious, if you are worried, tell yourself the truth. It is weak faith. And that's how I dealt with myself and I kept working on my faith. Okay, let's look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 26. So there's what is called weak faith. And weak faith, faith will not give you anything. Um, uh, Matthew 6, 26. The same Matthew 6. But he said to them, why are you fearful? All you of little, little faith. You remember the story? 
when they were out in the sea at night and then there was a storm and the disciples were afraid, Jesus Christ said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. There's what is called little faith. When you are afraid of the result, when you are afraid of the outcome, you know, of what you are trusting God for, when you are not sure, if you entertain fear in your life, just know you have not arrived. Walk on your faith. Let's look at um, Matthew 14, 31. I'm just trying to tell you how to walk and practicalize your faith for it to produce for you. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith. You remember the story about Peter when Jesus said he should come and he began to walk on water. But when he saw the boisterous wind, his heart sank and he began to sink. And Jesus Christ said, you, you were sinking because your faith was little. And so in the problems of lives, you're, you're, you will not get results if your faith is little. So you need to work on fear. You need to work on, stop looking at the, Abraham refused to look at the deadness. Peter looked at the, the storm, the physical, and refused to acknowledge the God that says come. You know? And so because of that, his faith didn't work. Okay, let's look at um, Matthew 14, 31. And immediately Jesus, Matthew, that what, okay. Okay, let's look at Matthew 16, verse 7. Matthew 16, verse 7. Matthew 16, verse 7. Okay, um, talking actually about, okay, let's look at um, Matthew. Now we are going to talk about great faith. Matthew 8, 9. Matthew 8, 9, what it means to have great faith. You, okay, um, you know about the story of the centurion. For also I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go and he goes, and to another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said, those who, to those who followed him, assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Great faith attracts the respect of God. Great faith attracts results. And of course, talking about this um, Syrophoenician woman won't go there anymore. When, of course, she talked about, um, won't, um, 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 you know, that they, they can also partake of the crumbs on the floor. Jesus Christ referred to her faith as great. You will make God stop for you when you have great faith. And that was exactly what God did when I was trusting God for children. I remember, of course, I've just talked about two principles. I won't talk about joy because the time is over, because that's actually very important. Because that's, as far as I'm concerned, that is the working of your faith. That's the proof you truly have faith. But talking about um, when God stops and acknowledges your faith, I remember at the point when, I, and I'll say that, um, Pastor, you can come up. Let me just say this, you know. Um, um, when you have great faith, God respects you. God acknowledges your faith. God stops for you. And your faith brings great result. You know, you know. And so I remember at the point when I knew my faith was absolute. I knew I had great faith. Because I had weighed, I have done practice. Even when I saw you know, my, my period, I was still going to do pregnancy tests. Because I was not working by sight. I was working by faith. I, not in a, you know, I've, I've said the story so many times here. But I remember a particular day, a friend of mine came to see me. And we were talking, I can't remember what led to it, and I said to her, that was when I said to her, that one thing I know about this issue of having children, eh, that God has, you know, my faith is absolute. You know, that if God decides not to give me children, it has nothing to do with my faith. Maybe God in his sovereignty decided to use me as, eh? Yes, overruled and decided to use me as a case study of somebody who had absolute faith, but still did not receive the promise. I said, that's all, there is nothing. And that night I slept. And then I had a dream. In that dream, then we were attending Living Faith. You know, I was attending Bible school in Living Faith. And there was a pastor in, that, in the dream that walked up to me. Of course, the pastor I used to recognize, I didn't even know his name. He walked up to me and the only thing he said to me in the dream was, the word of God will not fail in your life. And then I woke up that mo next mo the next morning, I quickly rushed to Bible school. And as I sat down, I turned and I saw that man I saw in my dream walking to the pulpit as a teacher. At first I thought maybe he was going coming to give announcements, you know, because I didn't think he was even a teacher in the an instructor. You know, but I saw him and I said, ah, this is the man I saw in my dream. And he walked to the pulpit, he greeted every one of us, and he said, we are be beginning a new course today. We are beginning, we are, I'm teaching you on the principles of faith. 
So you can imagine this faith I'm working on. This man shows up in my dream and tells me the word of God will not fail in my life. And the next day he's teaching us on the principles of faith. That was not a coincidence. And I think it was two months later, one day, I just missed my message, went to the hospital, and they said, they said I was pregnant. And after then, I didn't have to walk out my faith in that area. I got pregnant three other times, praise the Lord. I think we can stand up.